Good afternoon. And before I introduce the invited lecturer of the day, I would like to acknowledge that this week we had International Women Engineering Day. So I'd like to congratulate all the inspiring, talented and driven female engineers here and across the globe. Without further ado, the Adams Group is pleased to have with us Professor Gabrielle Sadowski. She has been full professor for thermodynamics at TU Dortmund University since, since 2001. Her research work focuses on modeling and analysis of properties of complex substances and their compositions. Above all, those with polymers, pharmaceutical substances, as well as chemical and biological reactions. Professor Sadowski has published over 230 articles in renowned international journals, which to date have been cited more than 8,000 times. She has already received several awards for her research. In 2011, she was among the 10 scholars to receive the Godfrey William Leibniz Prize, the most valuable international award for research. And she recently became the first woman to receive the Distinguished Lecturer Award in Thermodynamics and Transport, Transport Properties from the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. So welcome, Professor Sadowski. Thank you. And you now have the stage. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction and also for uh, giving me the opportunity to share some of our work with us. So the first thing I have to do is to share my, my screen. Uh, and I hope this worked. Do you see yes. my screen? Yes. 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 Nice. Great. So then I have. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much. This is indeed my, my first talk on, a, on this type of seminar. So I'm, I'm very happy about it. And I think it was a very nice idea, Freddie. In fact, I was very surprised and also very happy that you wrote me and invited me to give, to give this talk to you. Um, I, I ch chosen the topic uh, we have worked on for about eight to 10 years. Um, now applying thermodynamics to pharmaceutical systems. Uh, and this is uh, what I wanted to tell you uh, today a bit what, what we are doing in this field. And you see the title is Long-Term Stability of Amorphous Solid Dispersions. And I will, of course, in the next uh, talk, explain what, what this means and what it is about. It's about pharmaceuticals. Uh, and so, of course, as a thermodynamicist, we do not develop pharmaceuticals. But what I found out talking to my colleagues from pharmacy, that there are a lot of thermodynamic problems indeed involved in developing a medicine which contains a pharmaceutical. So this is what we call pharmaceutical ingredient or active pharmaceutical ingredient. And I will... Uh, I'll use API for short in the following of my talk. So this is actually the substance that does the job. This is really the ingredient. But the medicine is, of course, more than that. So this is what you take at home to get, uh, to, yeah, to get uh, something that makes you healthy again. So the problem the pharmacists have is that most of the pharmaceutical ingredients are very are very hydrophobic. So the, the thing is uh, that you have okay that you have a very uh, hydrophobic uh, substance, uh, and of course, if you take a medicine, it only takes its job if it can be dissolved in the body. So it needs to be hydrophilic uh, to be dissolved in the body, and then does what it should do. And so after you have developed a pharmaceutical ingredient, the next very important thing is uh, to make it soluble. And so to make it in a medicine that it can be really used by a patient. And indeed, solubility issues are so huge that 90% of the newly developed APIs, so those are the promising APIs in the pipeline of uh, medicine and pharmacy, never reach a patient. And this is due to the very, very low solubility. Uh, and what you see here is a nice picture. This is Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, he is sitting in front of Humboldt University in Berlin. 
It's a statue made of marble and he is sitting there since 1883. And although it's of course raining in Berlin, this statue is not dissolved yet. So, and this is because marble has a very small solubility. Uh, and the APIs I'm talking about have a solubility which is even lower than that. So the pharmacists call these substances brick dusts. So that is really almost impossible to get them dissolved. And so that's, that's the reason uh, that they have huge problems to develop new medicines. And this is where thermodynamics comes in. And this is where we thought we could contribute a bit uh, to solve these type of problems. So what is known is that uh, if you have an amorphous API compared to a crystalline ones, uh, the amorphous API has a higher solubility than the crystalline ones and uh, as important, they have a faster dissolution rate. So the thing is you only do not only need something that dissolves in water, but of course, if you take a tablet, then you have about one or two days for the tablet going through the body and only what's dissolved during this time is what you can really then have in the body and can does the job. So the, the idea is uh, what the Palmas is already investigating on is to formulate an API in an amorphous state. So this is the crystalline one and the amorphous state then has the advantage that you do not have a crystal lattice anymore, which needs to be broken during the dissolution process. So the solution of an amorphous API is much faster and also solubility is higher than that of the crystalline one. The disadvantage is that the uh, crystalline state is much more stable thermodynamically. So what happens is once you have somehow managed to produce an amorphous API, it will recrystallize. So that's one is what, what, the, what it wants to do. So it wants to lower its energy and it will then recrystallize. And that means, uh, yeah, this is uh, then again, you are then again back to the crystalline API. So there is a way around it. So what you need to do is you need to stabilize the amorphous state of the API. And one possibility to do that is to dissolve the API in a polymer matrix. So then once you have it really thermodynamically dissolved, then you have a molecularly a distinct API molecule. So they do not form a lattice anymore because they are dissolved and it's done by a polymer. And this is then what uh, is to be, for example, available as a tablet. Uh, and this is what the pharmacists call an amorphous solid dispersion. So what they mean is that it's amorphous in the best case. Uh, it looks like a solid because it looks like a tablet, although it's not crystalline, it's amorphous. Uh, and this is the pharmaceutical, let's say, word for saying this. So this is the type of uh, tablet. And it would best if it would be possible to keep all the API you would like to have to the patients in the amorphous state. So there are already uh, formulations on the market. That means these eyes, ASD uh, mixtures, they are also called formulations. And here you have some examples. This is only a few examples, but uh, you see of those type of formulations. You see what the API is. Uh, uh, you see polymers are used. And then these are so-called ASDs. The thing is uh, that they, uh, as a pharmacist, you have to make sure that it's not only possible to uh, get such a mixture, such a formulation, but also to keep it stable. So that means once it is produced, it should not change during storage. Uh, sometimes between production of a medicine and then uh, reaching the patient, it can take one year or two years. And uh, pharmacists have to make sure that uh, during that time, uh, the formulation stays what it is and does not change. Uh, and this is where thermodynamics comes in, because if we want to know whether a formulation is stable or not, the question is, is there a thermodynamic driving force to change? Uh, and once we want to know whether it's stable or not, as a pharmacist, we look at phase diagrams, of course. This is what you also used to. And the phase diagrams we are interested in, in this case, is a binary mixture of the polymer and the API. 
and then we need to have this as function of temperature. Uh, and then there are two lines which are of most thermodynamic importance. This is the solubility line. This is the orange one. And you have the black line. So let's look first at the orange line. This is a solubility line. And this means whenever we have a mixture in the orange area, it's below the solubility line. So at a given temperature, we would be super saturated as concent at concentrations right of the solubility line. And this means, of course, that being here, we get API crystals. So the API will recrystallize and we will end up here. And then in the remaining uh, mixture, we will have a concentration along the solubility line. So that means one, whenever we are in this orange region, we get API crystals. And this is in actually what we don't want to have. We want to have an amorphous formulation. So it's very important to know where the solubility line is. Now on top of this, you see what the pharmacists call amorphous phase separation. From a thermodynamic point of view, it's nothing else than a liquid-liquid demixing. And of course, you know that you have a binaural here and that on the two branches of the binaural at a given temperature, you get the concentrations of the two phases. So that means once you are here, uh, your, top, your tablet you have would phase separate. And this would mean that you could not assure that every single point of the tablet has, has the same dose with the same API content. So sometimes if you go to a doctor, the doctor says, take half a tablet. And then what you then do is you take the tablet and you break it into two pieces. And then of course, uh, you have to be sure, or you want to be sure that the two pieces of the tablet contain the same amount of API, so that you get the same dose taking each of these two halves. And that's why phase separation and any other inhomogeneity in the amorphous uh, tablet is something the pharmacists don't want to have. So this is also a region to avoid being here. And of course, in this particular case, this demixing region is completely below the solubility line. That means once you would be here, you would get phase separation. Uh, and after a while, you would also get crystals. And this is, again, what you don't want to have. So that means being in the orange or in the gray area means this, we, we do not want to be there. This is the unsafe region. So the best thing is simply to stay outside. So this is really the safe region where we, for all the composition temperature uh, points, we could uh, go here. We would have a thermodynamically stable RSD. And that means when, once we could be there, uh, those ASD would never change during storage, for example. Uh, and when we started this uh, research as a patient, I was, of course, hoping and also assuming uh, that all the ASDs on the market would be somewhere here. Uh, what we really indeed found is that, of course, you are usually at low temperatures. So this is the melting point of the API, and they are very high usually. So storage temperature or room temperature is somewhere down here. So this is the temperature range we are usually interested in. And then we have investigated several ASDs on the market and we have found them here or there. So actually the bad news is none of the formulations we have investigated so far is stable. So none of them was to, to be found here because what you see is uh, that at this low temperatures you can have only a very little API content in a tablet. Uh, and that means you would either have too little API in a tablet or you would have a huge tablet. And would be more like a cake um, for the given API dose. And that means the ASDs are usually uh, super saturated, meaning the API loading is usually higher uh, than the solubility of the API in a polymer. And that means that there is a certain danger that they will change. Um, uh, it's only a question of how long it takes. Uh, what helps a bit indeed, so this is a good news, uh, it's not only these two lines, but there is a third line which helps us, and this is the glass transition temperature. So we are in a polymer system, and polymers usually have a high glass transition temperature compared to the APIs. And that means 
once you have the polymer, you have a high glass transition temperature, and that means all points below the TG line, the green area here, they have a very, very high viscosity. And this means that the mobility of the molecules is very, very low. And that means they want to be crystallized because they know that they are right off the solubility line, but it will take very long. Uh, and of course, the bigger the distance to TG, the higher is the viscosity, so the longer you can at least kinetically stabilize thermodynamically supersaturated ASDs. And this is the second effect uh, the pharmacists make advantage of. So it's not only that they want to solubilize uh, the ASD in the polymer, but mainly they hope that by uh, TG, they can at least kinetically stabilize what they have. But of course, it's also interested in uh, interesting to know what the uh, supersaturation is, what the driving force to crystallization or to phase separation is. So and actually what we are doing in our group is to find out where these three lines are for a given polymer API uh, system, or usually you can change the polymer, but you cannot change the API. So the API is what, what uh, the medicine should contain, and you could select uh, the best polymer for a given API by, for example, looking at these three lines. So this is more or less what we are doing and what the talk will be about. There is one additional thing to uh, take in mind uh, that the phase diagram I have shown you is a binary phase diagram. It only contains the polymer on the left-hand side and the API on the right-hand side. Uh, if you have a tablet, uh, it's usually stored at home, in our homes, uh, and there is also a certain relative humidity, so there is water in the atmosphere. Uh, and this has a huge impact on these lines, and this is what the pharmacists also intuitively know. So they have uh, the rules uh, that a company has before um, purchasing a tablet, a company has to perform so-called stability tests, and they are defined uh, conditions at which these tests have to be performed. There is this test of, for example, running for 12 months um, at 25 degrees centigrade and 60% relative humidity. So this is what is assumed, let's say, an average um, atmosphere in a, in a home. They have to show that during this 12 months, uh, their formulation, so their tablet does not change its properties. Of course, 12 months is very long if you take in mind that the development of a medicine is very, very expensive. Uh, and so during this 12 months, you cannot uh, sell, yeah, you can simply not get uh, uh, yeah, money. So, and that's why they have developed a so-called accelerated stability test, which lasts for six months only, but the conditions are, let's say, harsher than these ones. So the storage is at 40 degrees centigrade and 75% relative humidity. Uh, and what they assume is that they get almost the same information as for the above conditions, but in shorter times. Uh, and I will show you that this is unfortunately not true. But this is, uh, let's say, the idea behind that to show before you purchase uh, a medicine to a patient, you make sure that uh, it's stable when stored uh, at home conditions. Uh, and of course, if you have water uh, in the system, I mean in the atmosphere, then it will be absorbed uh, in the ASD. Because the thing is, the API on the right hand side is very hydrophobic, but the polymer usually is not. Uh, if you take a tablet, it should dissolve. So the polymer is usually chosen as a hydrophilic one. So that should dissolve very fast, then releasing the API. That's the idea. The disadvantage is if you have a hydrophilic polymer, it does not only very fast dissolve in water, but it also absorbs water from the atmosphere uh, to a certain extent. And once you have the water in a tablet, of course, the API was not, does not want to be dissolved any longer because it does not want to be dissolved in water. That is where the problem comes from. Uh, and that means in the ternary system at these conditions, the solubility line is completely different. Uh, so you have a hydrophilic formulation on the left-hand side of the diagram because here you have huge amount of the hydrophilic polymer. 
you have a hydrophobic uh, formulation on the right hand side because here you have mostly the hydrophobic API. So at a fixed relative humidity, the formulations along this axis do absorb different amount of water. The uh, absorbed amount of water is increasing from the right to the left. And what you see is particularly at the regions where you have low amount of water absorbed, the solubility line does change dramatically. And that means a point which was at dry conditions left of the solubility line, which is a safe region, whereas we got crystals only when being right of the solubility line. So this point, which was safe at dry conditions, is now at uh, humid conditions right of the solubility line because the solubility line changed very much to the left. And that means um, that this point will also crystallize at humid conditions, so during storage. So it means it's not only enough to look at the dry ASD and the solubility line in the dry ASD, because what is stable at dry conditions might be unstable at humid conditions. And actually we found this quite often, uh, that due to the water absorption from the atmosphere, the system becomes a terminal system, may contain up to 30% of water, uh, just by absorption from, from the atmosphere and then uh, end up this API crystallized. And that means that the stability test would uh, reveal that this is not a stable formulation and this is again a reason that it cannot reach the market. So this is really a very serious problem. And it's a thermodynamic problem, which is of course nice for us. So the question is, how can we, how can we do that? So what can we contribute? And uh, what we can from, from some number point of view, we can calculate what the solubility is. So this is a simple version uh, of the uh, solid liquid equilibrium equation we are using. So this is textbook thermodynamics. You have probably already seen something like this. Uh, this is the uh, mole fraction solubility of the API. It depends on temperature, of course. It depends on the melting properties of the API. And it depends on the activity coefficient of the API in a polymer system or at humid conditions in the polymer water system. Uh, so this is really the property where the polymer and water come in. And this is, of course, what we need to know uh, to get uh, the solubility. So um, this is actually what we do getting or for getting this orange line. And for the liquid-liquid demixing, uh, you, of course, know that this is the type of equations to apply. So for every component, water, polymer, and API, we have this uh, equilibrium conditions. And the nice thing is uh, we have, again, to know what the activity coefficients are. So this is the same thing uh, as we have here in a solid uh, liquid equilibrium equation. So that means miscibility and solubility can be modeled using only one and the same model for the activity coefficient. And of course, in fact, as a thermodynamicist, you know several uh, activity coefficient models, and you could, in fact, in general, use any of uh, those. Uh, the model we are using for this purposes is uh, PC soft. So that means we uh, have the Helmholtz energy of a system, and once we know that, we can then derive or suspect to the mole number of the different components, and then we get the chemical potentials, and from then we then get uh, the activity coefficients. Uh, and PC soft as such is um, a Helmholtz energy which is composed of different contributions. So we have a repulsive uh, contribution that accounts for the fact that the molecules have a volume, and also for the fact that they are not spheres, but they have more like a chain-like structure. Then we have an, a Van der Waals attraction term, which accounts for the fact that molecules also attract each other. Um, and so this is a, a second contribution. The third one, which is the A uh, in PC SAF and also in SAFT, uh, is the one that accounts for hydrogen bonds. And of course, uh, as we are dealing with water, as for example, the absorbed component, uh, we have a uh, huge amount of hydrogen bonds. And also most of the pharmaceuticals of the API 
are indeed uh, hydrogen bond formers. So this is the only chance to get at least a little bit of them in, in water because uh, usually these are huge uh, molecules. So we do need uh, this contribution and then we have a uh, fourth one for uh, accounting for the fact that molecules may have a dipole or a quadrupole and we even have a fifth one which I do not show here uh, in case that the molecules also carry uh, charges, uh, which is not the case for the examples I, I show you here. So this is uh, the model we are using and then we uh, calculate the activity coefficients for the different components and solve the phase equilibrium conditions and then uh, calculate the phase diagram. So this is nothing special here. Thermodynamics is uh, just the same as the one you know. The only thing is we apply it to pharmaceutical components, but this is really nothing, it's nothing special about this. Um, so what you need, of course, you need the model parameters for the different components. Uh, and in the meanwhile time, we have a database where we have more than 500 substances, uh, among them about uh, 100 organic solvents, 40 polymers, which is, of course, important for the ASDs, uh, and about 30 APIs. So and once you have this, uh, you can then go ahead and like uh, form mixtures out of these components and then calculate the phase diagrams. Uh, and the information we then get is, for example, solubility and miscibility. These are the two lines I have shown you. Uh, and they are very much influenced by the absorption of water. So this is an solid liquid equilibrium, liquid liquid equilibrium, and this is of course a vapor liquid equilibrium. And if we are talking about the influence of water absorption on solubility or miscibility, we have uh, at least two of these uh, simultaneously, which we also then solve simultaneously uh, for calculating these lines. So and once you have this, you get, a, you get the phase diagrams and then an idea about what the physical stability is. And this is then the information we uh, try to share with uh, our pharmacists and help them to find uh, appropriate polymers for their ASDs and their given storage conditions. I want to show you a few examples how this look like. So this is a paracetamol. Uh, first example is paracetamol um, in an ASD with PVPVA64. This is a copolymer, which is composed of PVP, polyvinyl pyrolidone, and PVA, which is polyvinyl acetate. And 64 means that this is a 60 to 40 uh, ratio of these monomer units in the copolymer. So the pharmacists, as you can imagine, cannot use any polymer. So they have, of course, to make sure that the polymers they are using are so-called FDA approved. So the variety of polymers is not very large. They can use in their formulations. And this is one of the polymers they use quite often. So this is really one you might, might maybe find this also in, in a medicine you have uh, already taken yourself. Uh, so now the question is, how does this phase diagram look like, particularly when we also uh, ask for the influence of humidity? And this is the phase diagram for the dry system. So RH is zero. We have indeed only two components. Um, and the orange line is the one we got for the sol solid liquid equilibrium calculated with PC saft. Um, and the black one is a comparison with Flory Huggins, which is uh, the model the pharmacists usually uh, use to describe those type of systems. Uh, and once you know what the um, amount of the different components is uh, and their uh, TG and density, you can use a different type of model, which is called Gordon Taylor model. Uh, and then you can calculate what TG is. And as I said, this is a very interesting line and that's why we usually also draw this line. So this is what we got. Uh, these two models are identical here for high temperatures and high API contents because what usually people do is they make DSC measurement, measurements um, and then they measure the melting point depression of the pure API uh, at high API contents. So 
this usually you have experimental data up here measured by DSC. So you know what the solubility line is at about 150 degrees centigrade. Uh, the problem is uh, what you want to know is what the solubility is at 25 degrees centigrade or maybe at 37. This is, let's say, the temperatures that are of relevance for pharmaceutical systems. So the, the uh, task is to use uh, DSC data up here, which cannot be taken down here for different reasons. So you have experimental data down here, and then you want to extrapolate down to small, low temperatures, and then you want to know what happens here. And this, you see that the uh, models do differently in terms of um, extrapolation. And then to verify, yeah, what, what is what is really the experimental uh, result? We have spray dried formulations of these two components, the polymer and the API, at different API contents. You see, we have six samples, and then we store these samples at 25 uh, de degrees centigrade at in a dry system, so really no relative humidity. And then you have the symbols here. And a stars mean that the samples crystallize, that we did find crystals in the samples, and circles mean that we did not find crystals. And according to the solubility line, no, no sample left of the solubility line should ever crystallize. Uh, and what you see indeed that after 24 months, so the numbers here indicate months, after 24 months, we did not find crystals left to the solubility line. So that means um, this is what we expected and this is ongoing. So from time to time, we take these samples out and see whether we find crystals, yes or no. Uh, and so far, we did not find any sample which violated our predictions. The samples right of the solubility line should crystallize at least at infinite time. Uh, and what you see is three of them already crystallized after four, seven, and 12 months. So you see it really takes quite long, which is nice for the pharmacists. So it's really they have a certain time, that's because we are below TG. So this indeed helps uh, to keep the system at least kinetically stable. This sample, uh, going according to our prediction, we also expect this sample to crystallize, uh, which may happen uh, during the next year or maybe in the next 10 years or, or whenever. So this can take infinitely long. This is very close to the solubility line. Driving force is very low to crystallize and you can indeed see it takes quite long. And of course, this is a guy we are very curiously looking at from time to time, and hopefully we will see crystals uh, yeah, within the next year, so to say. So that means as long as we do not find crystals left of the solubility line, uh, we are fine. Uh, right, we can find stars, crystals, or amorphous samples, particularly those very close to the solubility line, and we believe that this will crystallize. So what happens if we now increase relative humidity? So we have different storage chambers. We have a lot of storage chambers in, in the meantime, hundreds of samples uh, st uh, storing there at different conditions. And of course, one of these conditions is 60% uh, relative humidity. And this is again 25 degrees centigrade. You see our prediction. So the, the solubility lines are of course affected. Uh, by the fact that the relative humidity is higher than on the left hand side, but also TG. TG is very much affected, particularly on the left hand side of the diagram where a lot of water is absorbed. So water is a plasticizer and that means it decreases drastically TG from dry conditions to 60% relative humidity. That's why we have a maximum here. So the TG is going down, uh, particularly on a polymer rich side, because here we have a huge amount of water. Uh, and then we have again the samples, and you see they crystallized very fast this time. This is two weeks, two weeks, three months. This sample is sitting exactly on a solubility line, so it might crystallize, but at very, very long time. These samples are outside the solubility line, so we do not expect them to crystallize ever. <coughs> and then this is 75% relative humidity. 
storage is at 40 degrees centigrade. These are the so-called accelerated conditions. And what you see is, now all the samples are above Tg. All samples are above Tg. So that means now kinetics doesn't help anymore. This is really only thermodynamics what we see. There's no kinetic um, hindrance anymore for crystallizing. And again, all the samples right of the solubility line did crystallize and all the ones left did not. So that means indeed that the solubility line should be somewhere between this and this sample. And this is also what our prediction says. So we are very um, happy with, with, with this. So and this says that instead of waiting two years uh, I'm sorry, waiting one year for this result and waiting half a year for this result, uh, the prediction can tell in advance what will happen. Of course, um, for the FDA improvement, the experiments have to be performed, but at least you know in advance which are the promising polymers and which are maybe not that promising. <coughs> and this is to show how we, how we find the crystals. This is not just that we look at the samples, but we do have now what we make is we make peaks ID measurements and then you see this is a pure polymer uh, and uh, the very much on the top is a pure paracetamol in this case and then you have the samples in between and what you see is that for example for this one this is the 0.4 sample uh, this is the peaks ID measurement after 12 months and what you see is you see this very little uh, Peaks ID peaks here saying we, we do see crystals here, but we don't see crystals at 0.3. And this is how we, how we measure uh, those samples and detect um, peaks ID besides DS, DSC measurements. This is also what we, what we do uh, on top. This is another example where we have ibuprofen and PVP. This is again the solid liquid equilibrium line. You see here. Here you see the DSC measurements, which we have at high temperatures, but we would like to know what happens here at 25. Uh, this is a dry system, and this is the system which we use to fit the KIJ between the ibuprofen and the PVP. So the orange line here is the correlation. And then uh, we predicted what would happen if we increase relative humidity, for example, uh, to 75. Uh, before that, I show you the uh, very, the, yeah, the results of our formulation uh, storage measurements at this time, this is not months, but days, obviously. Uh, and again, we found crystals here after 160 days. We have no crystals so far after more than three years. Uh, this, is more, this is more time than for a PhD thesis. So what you see is this are really long-term projects. Uh, this is not crystallized yet, and we do not expect these samples uh, ever to crystallize. We are looking uh, particularly at this one, and we hope it will crystallize one day. And then we predicted what will happen if we go to 75% relative humidity. Uh, what you see is then, uh, in addition to uh, influence on the solubility line, we do get a miscibility gap on the left-hand side. So this is a huge miscibility gap we have here. And here you see this little orange line here. This is then the extension of the solubility line on the other side of the liquid-liquid miscibility gap. And then we were curious to know whether this is uh, right or wrong. Uh, and again, we have prepared our formulations. We stored them at 40 degrees centigrade because this is a temperature that belongs to 75% relative humidity. And then we can see what, we, what did we expect. So these three samples to the very right, they are right of the solubility line, so we expect them to crystallize. All the others are left of the solubility line, so we did not expect any of those to crystallize. But these three here on the left-hand side, they are right in the center of the miscibility gap. So we expected to find a demixing here. No crystals, but demixing. And the ones in the middle, particularly this one, but maybe also this one, this was what we expected not to crystallize nor to demix. So this is, let's say, these two, these are the ones we expected to be stable. This is what the pharmacists want to have. And then we did our measurements, uh, and this is uh, the outcome of the measurement. What you see is that the demixing took part very, very short time. This is days again. 
So this in the first day we saw the mixing here in these samples. Uh, after five days, these sample crystallize, and then you see it took longer for the next and the next sample to crystallize. <coughs> and these two samples here in the in the middle, uh, they did not crystallize so far, which is a nice agreement uh, with our prediction. Of course, we have a look at uh, this sample or uh, still. Uh, and yeah, we will see whether it will for, it will for sure not demix anymore and it will also not crystallize anymore. And that's why we believe that this as well as this one is stable. So that was very surprising from a pharmacist because their experience usually is the higher the API content, the higher is the risk uh, that something unwanted happens. But this time it is really the ones in the middle. Uh, and then we did a uh, Raman spectroscopy. This is a confocal Raman spectroscopy, so we could make a scan here. This is micrometer, so this is a 100 to 100 micrometer scan. <coughs> and the uh, API concentration is color-coded, so that means red means high API concentrations, blue means low API concentrations, and you could easily see that there is a demixing. You could even uh, see how big uh, the droplets are and the very scary thing for the pharmacist was that the target concentration indeed was 0.2. So this is the green arrow here, this is the concentration they wanted to have in their tablet. And if you look at this diagram then you see there is indeed not a single point in the formulation where you have this target concentrations but instead you have two peaks here, one at about 0.4 and one at about 0.05. <coughs> this is really a huge difference in con API concentration in the two phases uh, and it very nicely also fits uh, with our prediction. So this is 0.4 and this is 0.0304. So this is uh, really again a very nice proof uh, that the phase diagram is probably uh, very reasonable. And then uh, we measured the water sorption. So this is a homemade uh, water sorption apparatus here. We have an equilibrium cell. This is where we have uh, our spray dried formulation and they are hanging, hanging on a hook and the hook is connected via a magnetic coupling with a balance. So this on top of this, this is actually the balance. So this uh, sample is hanging on a balance and uh, the whole thing can be kept on a constant temperature. So there is no door at the moment. Usually, of course, there's a door, but now we can see the inside. So uh, the whole vessel here is at a certain temperature. And then we have a vapor, vapor tank outside uh, where we produce water vapor and this then enters the cell. And then we can have a very defined uh, partial pressure of water in the system. So we can adjust very nicely the relative humidity in the system and if water is absorbed here in a sample it gets heavier. That is quite simple. Uh, and this is what the balance tells us. So we can measure the water uptake by simply weighing the sample. So this is nothing very uh, special and very simple and very nice measurement and this is the outcome of such a measurement. You see the formulation at the dry condition. This is what the weight of the dry formulation was. Uh, and then we started the experiment, so exposed the formulation to a certain relative humidity and then more, more immediately, so within 30 minutes, we have a huge water uptake. So that means this is really the absorption of water from the atmosphere into the formulation in the tablet, so to say. And then you see that it stays more or less constant for a while and then it's decreasing. It's sharply decreasing and then reaching again a plateau. And the question is what, what happens here? It's much slower. What you see, the decrease is much slower than the increase. And what happens here, so we assume that it would be due to crystallization of the API and that's why we made uh, PXID measurements. And indeed what we found is that the sample up here is still amorphous, whereas the sample at the end is crystalline. And that makes sense because if you have the water in the system, 
the API doesn't want to be dissolved anymore. So the, it's much more super saturated than before. So it starts crystallizing and crystallizing takes a while. So, and then the more crystals you have, uh, the less water can be absorbed because crystals do not absorb water. This is only absorbed by the uh, amorphous environment. And that means water is released again. So this is what we see as release of water and this at the same time means growing crystals. So that means we can really observe crystals growing simply by weighing the sample. Uh, this is really nice. And what you also see is absorption is very fast. So if you have your tablet at home and you put it on a table uh, and you might have 50 or 60% relative humidity, then it will absorb water. And once the water is in there, the, the uh, API will crystallize. You cannot stop this process except uh, taking out all of the water, for example, by connecting your tablet to a vacuum pump, but most of us don't have a vacuum pump at home. So that means once you have uh, the water absorbed in the tablet, it will crystallize. And then, uh, of course, uh, after this crystallization is in equilibrium, as a rest, which is not crystallized of the matrix, still absorbs water, and this is what you see, what you see at the end, at the plateau. So what we did is, uh, we took this uh, absorption curve and we recalculated it because we can calculate how much water is absorbed in a fully amorphous sample. We can also calculate how much water is in the fully crystallized sample, fully crystallized meaning every API that wants to crystallize is crystallized. We can calculate how much water will, this sample will be absorbed and we prove that is correct what we do. And that means that we can do the same thing for every point in between. So we can translate by using a model this water uptake curve into a crystallization kinetic curve. And this is what you see here. Uh, and then you can see how long it took to crystallize. So it was about 30, day, uh, 30 hours. So after one day, uh, it's done. Of course, depending on the system, this is what I want to show you. This is nifedipine and PVAC, this is polyvinyl acetate. This is uh, a less hydrophilic polymer at the uh, accelerated storage conditions. And we did the investigation for different API loadings. So we have different API loadings here. The higher the API loading is, the higher is the supersaturation. So that means the faster is the crystallization. And this is also what you see here. Higher API loadings means faster crystallization. And this is now what we can measure, what we really can quantify. So the higher the API loading, the uh, higher the danger of getting crystals in the uh, formulation. More interestingly is temperature. So you see we have done this at 4 degrees centigrade, this is the accelerated condition, 30 and 35. <clears throat> and you see that this really makes a huge difference, particularly at 30 degrees centigrade there is almost no crystallization. This is because the glass transition temperature of this formulation, this is 0.8, uh, drug load of nifedipine and PVSA is indeed between here. So this sample is below glass transition and this is above. And you can really see that that makes a huge of a difference. So the lower the temperature, uh, the, the more we are away from TG, the better. So TG, uh, temperature is really a huge factor and uh, lower temperatures are much better than higher temperatures. And then most interestingly, we investigated different relative humidities. <coughs> and then you see as this is 60, 75, and 90. Uh, and what you see is again, what we saw already from the phase diagrams before, uh, the higher the um, relative humidity, the higher is the super saturation. This is one point. And the other is the lower is TG. So both of these influences go, let's so to say in the wrong direction. Uh, and that means high relative humidities are really something we should, we should avoid if you want to have a stable ASD. And if you take a medicine at home, then you have a package insert uh, and it says usually 
store, cool and dry. Uh, and we can see here from these diagrams that this makes a lot of sense. So we should take this really seriously. Uh, and what I did not understood as a patient before we have made this investigation is when they say store it dry, then they mean store it dry. And dry means dry, so that means relative humidity zero. And of course, none of us has this at home, particularly not in a bathroom usually. So this is really looking at this phase diagram, it, uh, everything makes sense and we are now also able to quantify this by using thermodynamics. Uh, and with this, I come to my take home messages. Uh, talking about uh, stability of ASDs in thermodynamic terms, API, solubility, and polymers, uh, we have to account for, of course, kind of polymer and API. So the API is usually fixed, but the kind of polymer can be changed at least to a certain extent. Uh, and it also make, uh, diff makes a difference with the molecular radius and copolymer composition. I did not show here, but it does make a difference. <coughs> Temperature is important point and most importantly uh, humidity is something we should really avoid. Uh, this is uh, the bad news and I was uh, very uh, surprised about this and this means we have to be very careful uh, and we have particularly to avoid a humidity because usually the tablets we have they will change this time uh, and uh, what the pharmacists do to avoid that and to keep humidity out is they put the tablets into blisters. And this is for good reasons, as we have seen. So once you have a blister at home, uh, leave the tablet in the blister as long as you can uh, and only take it out immediately before you take the medicine. So this is really thermodynamically meaningful. Uh, and of course, once we know what the reason is, and once we know how to produce a phase diagram, uh, we then can understand what is behind, and we can then really find out what the critical quality attributes are. So we then can understand what does the polymer do, what does the water do to the uh, stability. And once we know that, we can then uh, design formulations that have, have hopefully a uh, better thermodynamic stabilities um, as the ones we have at the moment, or if we can accelerate the time uh, or accelerate, let's say, the speed, so to say, for uh, new developments. Uh, and with this, I would uh, really like to thank first uh, my group. So you see, this is a very brand new group photo, obviously. Uh, so we make a group photo every year. Uh, uh, this time we did also a group photo, but this is, uh, as you can see, a Corona group photo. So we kept the distances we have to keep. So this is one and a half meter between each of us and it's outside. Uh, but still, uh, we are there working on these topics and we are uh, quite, quite happy and I'm very proud of my group. So I thank them very much. And I, could, of course, I also like that you are still uh, with me here in this chat, I hope. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gabi. Thank you, Professor Sudowski, for this marvelous presentation. We are now open for questions. If you want to ask one, please enable your microphone or write it down at the chat and we'll read it. Our YouTube viewers can write it down also, of course. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I start? Of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we, we saw a very nice picture and, uh, and very nice prediction from the uh, modern. But uh, we know that uh, uh, the hydrophobicity uh, uh, of water is not really taken account uh, in PC soft. Uh, do you think that uh, if we include they have hydrophobic contribution can improve either more uh, your predictions or it's not important. Uh, uh, what do you mean by hydrophobicity of water? Uh, well, uh, if you want to modern like a protein, uh, the, the entropic part for uh, 
for the uh, world organizations is very important uh, and make uh, maybe the uh, the majority part of free energy uh, contribution. So uh, uh, I wonder this uh, pharmaceutical is high, very hydrophobic. Uh, 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 the the uh, entropy from water is very important, close to these uh, molecules. Yeah, uh, the, the, diff the molecules we look at here are much smaller than proteins, actually. Uh, and so what, what do we what do what would we mean is that if you have a very huge molecule, uh, then it might have a tertiary and secondary structure. So it, it, it refolds, so to say, depending on the hydrophobicity <laughs> of the environment. Yes. Uh, and this changes also, of course, the uh, properties of the of the molecule. But this is what we do not have here. The molecules we have here. Uh, don't have a ternary structure. They cannot fold or unfold. They can also not form micelles or stuff like this. So they are the molecular weight is between, let's say, in the order of 300, 400, 500 grams per mole. So this is the order of molecules we have here. Uh, and I think this is, of course, easier than to work with, uh, with proteins which can have very specific interaction and can change their own structure due to the fact that they are in water. So this is what we don't have here, fortunately. Uh, so this is, uh, in this respect, this is easier, much easier than, than working with proteins. And of course, although it's a model, I, we are fully aware of, of the fact that what we, what we do is, is modeling. And a model has, not, has let's say, also certain uh, restrictions. Uh, so far, we are, I would say we are quite happy with, with what we get. But this does, of course, not mean that it cannot be improved. I mean, this is probably always the case. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Professor Bruno Lotta. Um, I'm not going to read it, or you can read it also. Uh, with that. <laughs> Br Bruno can ask. Yourself? No, he, is, he, is, he has a problem with the microphone. Ah, um, okay, okay. A minute, please. Uh, first of all, very nice talk. First question, we, in, in Rio, we have 90% our age, humidity, and 40 degrees Celsius, and especially at <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Shall we keep our medicine in the fridge? And next question is, second question, he said, 75% are our age is the atmospheric humidity, right? How do you, how do you actually account for water content in the model? Okay, the first the first question was should we should we store the uh, medicine in the fridge? Was this the first question? Yeah, in real, because real is really. Humid. I would say yes. So you should certainly not store it in a bathroom. A lot of people do that. I did this myself several years ago. <laughs> so I would not store it in a bathroom, I would definitely store it in the fridge. And if there is, uh, if, if it is in blisters, we have to know that blisters are expensive. So for a company, it's very expensive to have uh, tablets and blisters. And th that tells us they do this for a good reason. Uh, and I have shown you what the reasons are. So my uh, suggestion is, my, my really my strong suggestion is don't take it out of the blister, uh, but uh, do this and then eat it immediately. And not use these boxes where you can have your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth portion for one week. And if you, you have seen, it takes half an hour. Uh, and if you store it there uh, in the humidity for seven days, I mean, it's done. Of course, it depends on a particular system, that's true, but uh, in general, I would, I would store it in the fridge. So this was the first question. The second, could you repeat the second question? Yes, of course. Um, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I raised my hand. Um, the second one is about, uh, second one, 75 RH is the atmosphere humidity, right? Yeah, that's true. How do you actually account for water content in the model? Yeah, so what we do uh, is, uh, if I show you such a diagram here, let's take this one in the middle. 
This is actually to get this orange line. This is a three component calculation because we have polymer, we have the API and we have water. And it is a three phase calculation because we have crystals, which are the API crystals. We have the liquid phase, this is this one, which contains polymer, API and water. And we have a vapor phase that contains water vapor. So if, if you see this orange line, this is a result of a three phase, three component calculation. So we simultaneously uh, solve uh, the vapor liquid equilibrium of water. So the RH gives us water activity in the liquid. This is what it does. So this is fixed. The water activity in the uh, formulation is fixed by fixing RH because this is what it is. And then we do the solubility calculation of the API by fixing the water composition, uh, the water activity, not the water concentration, but the water activity to 0.6. Uh, and then calculate what the polymer and API concentration is in equilibrium with the pure API. So it's, it's, it's a little, little bit more complicated than it looks like. So um, that means if the uh, water activity is 0.6, in the whole diagram, this does mean that for every single API polymer ratio, we have a different water content uh, in the liquid. Because what we fix is the water activity, and that means that at different API polymer ratios, we have different water concentrations in the system. This is, you cannot see this from this diagram, but the concentration of water is changing from the right to the left. On the right, we have little water because this is very hydrophobic. And on the left, we have much more water because this is very hydrophilic. And at the same water activity, it absorbs much more water than on the right. And this is, for example, you can see this on a TG line because usually the line would go up as it goes in the left diagram. And it only goes down here uh, because we have here considered that we have here a water concentration in the formulation which is much higher than here at fixed relative humidity. So the concentration of water is changing during the whole diagram and this is what we calculate. This is how we do this. I do not, I hope that this answers the question, but uh, if there's any more on this, you can, yeah, please, please ask again. Okay. It's clear. I think, yeah. Uh, we have a question is on our YouTube also or to be streaming um three, three questions from silvana materi i think it's his name and the first one is what kind of data were used to parameterize the eos the equation of states this is a very good question and not an easy easy one i mean i can answer it of course but it's it's a very good one so the thing is we have in this system, we have uh, the API, we have the polymer, and we have water. For the low volatile, uh, for the high volatile components like water or solvents or other components, volatile components, we do what every everybody else is doing. Uh, we fit the parameters to liquid densities and vapor pressures. This is not possible for the polymer. Polymers do have a liquid density, so sometimes we know what it is. They, of course, do not have vapor pressures. Uh, and that's why for polymers, we usually use once available liquid densities. And then to get the uh, induction energy, the, the U in the model, uh, we use polymer solubilities in different solvents. Uh, and this is similar to what we do for these components. So the APIs are usually crystalline components in the pure state. And that means they do not have a liquid density and they do not have a vapor pressure. Uh, and that's why we use solubility data of APIs in solvents. Uh, we could, we usually use solvents with where the APIs have a medium solubility. Um, if the solubility is too low, for example, in water, it would be an idea to use solubility in water to fit the binary parameters or to fit the few component parameters of, of the APIs. But as the solubility in the water is usually so low, it's hard to measure. 
So there is very, a very high uncertainty in the data. And on top of this, they usually depend on pH, which again gives um, an additional um, difficulty. So that's why we use uh, usually solubilities in organic solvents because they do not depend on pH and they are much higher usually than the ones in water. So we can easily measure them. But the thing is, if you use a solvent where the API is too uh, is very high soluble, then you need a lot of API simply to, to make these measurements and the APIs are usually very expensive. So that's why we, we usually choose medium uh, solvents, medium good solvents for the API. Uh, and we have found ways to, uh, to very quickly produce the solubility data using very small amounts of the API. And then of course you need to know what the parameters for the solvents are. I mean, this is of course what you need, but we, I have shown that we have about 500 solvents. So usually we know the solvent parameters uh, and then we need, we, we take the solubility data uh, and then we uh, use uh, the SLE equation, this one. Of course, what you see is uh, that we need to know uh, also the melting properties of the API, but they are usually available. Uh, and then we fit uh, the pure component parameters of the API to the solubility data. And it turned out to work. So it's we then proof that we can use the same parameters to calculate the solubility of the same API and different solvents. Uh, and once we believe that we have a parameter set that works not only in one solvent, but also in different ones, and this is the one we go with. Thank you. And the next question from the same person is Silvana Matetti. Uh, APS does not have a different conformers. How does it affect timer chemistry data, melting temperature and enthalpies, and solubility data? So this variation does not affect the US parametrization. Sorry. That is also a good question. Uh, I think you refer to polymorphs. Uh, so indeed the molecules we are talking about are very complex molecules, although not that complex uh, proteins, but they are already complex and most of them have more than one crystal structure. This is what we call different polymorphs. And the thing is, if we look at this equation, if we have a different crystal lattice for one and the same A. API, this will result in different melting enthalpy and different melting temperature. So usually the different polymorphs have different melting properties. Uh, and that's why they also do have different solubilities. Uh, this property is a liquid property. So this refers to the interactions between the dissolved molecule and the solvent molecule. And that means that this property does not know uh, what the crystal lattice is because this is a liquid phase property. And this is very nice because uh, once we know the, the liquid, I mean the equation of state parameters are parameters for describing the liquid property. So we can use any polymorph of a substance uh, to determine its parameters. And once we have these parameters, uh, then we can even predict, I don't have a slide at the moment, but we can, we have several of these examples and all of them work. So if we, we then go to a different polymorph and somebody gives us uh, the melting properties of the other polymorph, we then can predict what the solubility of the other polymorph is. So this works quite nice. So the last one. Uh, from the same person, we had a lot of questions. In the sorption equipment, the XRD is measuring line, I mean, during the gravity measurement? Uh, not in this one. Uh, in the meantime, we have, I think we have three sorption, we have, we have actually four sorption me measurements. This is the earliest one, and the PXRD is not in line. So for the measurements I have shown you here, we, sim we really took samples. So we have repeated this measurement, this particular measurement, 
So we really opened uh, this cell here, which actually finishes the measurement. We opened it, took the sample out, and then made a PXID. And then we started with, a, let's say, a twin sample, uh, the measurement again from the beginning and then to the end and took the sample at the very end. Uh, in the meantime, we have a much more, let's say, advanced setup uh, where we can make uh, PXID measurements in line. So we, we, at the, we have now, it's, it's not this one, but we have a different apparatus where we can do uh, uh, make sorption measurements and at the same time without taking the, taking the sample out PXID measurements. Uh, so we do have this, but these measurements were done by really taking the sample out and make the measurements. But it's, it's available, of course, combined, but of course it's much more expensive than the other one. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from our chat. Um, is for P Professor Zhang. I'm going to read it. Can anyone please help me with my question, of course. Very nice talk indeed. My question, how can we construct a full phase diagram for polymers, API and water in, in experiments? Also, if there is a way to construct the full diagram, it is helpful at all pharmaceuticals to have such full phase diagram. diagram. Sorry. Uh, the second question first. Yes, this is very helpful. <laughs> Uh, so we, we try, the thing is when we, when we uh, have read a lot of, or, and we do read a lot of pharmaceutical literature, and the problem is that they usually report uh, results of experiments. Of course, I mean, this makes a lot of sense, but they make screening experiments, they vary this and this variable, and then they measure this and this. And then they report, in these cases we have measured this, and in other cases we have measured something different. What is really missing, and this is what the beauty of a phase diagram is, that you can put all these different results at different compositions and temperatures and everything into one diagram, and then everything makes sense. I mean, you can then really see that these type of samples having, for example, high API concentrations, they had to crystallize, whereas the ones at lower API crystal, uh, content or lower humidity uh, obviously should not have crystallized and indeed they did not but the diagram really helps to explain what happens and also to foresee uh, what will happen uh, and so this is one of the tasks i would say this is one thing we are really dealing with over the last years to talk to people from pharmacy and to say and we believe that they did the right measurements, but the thing is, if you want to understand what you have and if you want to really to, to, to know in advance what, what happens, the best thing to look at is really a phase diagram. And so we convince them, I would say more or less, and, and we are, or we are going to convince them, at least we try, uh, that this is a very helpful tool. And that's why we also producing uh, now not only these, I call this a quasi uh, binary phase diagram. So you see we have only the two components here uh, shown, but indeed we have a third component which is here. This is what we mainly do for the pharmacists because this is the diagram, that, I mean, this is what they think of, they think of their formulation and this is then down here. Indeed, it is much more helpful even to construct ternary diagrams or triangles and then to have the three components. And this is what we now uh, also more and more use and also, let's say, tell the pharmacists that this is indeed the best diagram. The best diagram is a triangle uh, and we are constructing and we did this in the past and we are still uh, as an ongoing task, so to say, uh, to look at different combinations of um, ASDs and polymers and then uh, construct uh, the phase diagram for different humidities and to see where we are at certain conditions. And this is very, very helpful. And we are producing those diagrams. And to do it experimentally is really challenging because if you are in a water rich uh, site, this is a solution of water with uh, API and polymer. If you are here on a polymer site, this looks like a solid. I mean, it's not a solid, but it's a super cooled liquid. So it has a very high viscosity. 
Uh, and you cannot simply mix water and uh, polymer and an API and then get to these compositions here. So the question is, how do we get the water in here? Um, and this is usually done by sorption. So and that means you need different techniques to uh, produce uh, these mixtures and also different techniques to investigate those mixtures. So we have a combination of uh, sorption measurements. These are the ones we perform at lower water contents, particularly here in this side. We have other apparatuses where we have liquids, really, which we stir and then take samples. Uh, we produce formulations by spray drying, we produce films, uh, depending on where we are in the diagram. So this is not one technique that you can use to uh, access a whole phase diagram. That makes this thing very uh, challenging, not only from the modeling part, but also from the experimental point of view. That's totally true. Thank you. Uh, Silvana Mad, Mad, I got wrong all the time, but Silvana Madetti said thank you on YouTube. Silvana Madetti, uh, eh, yeah. Sadov knows Silvana Madetti from Bahia. Oh, from Bahia. <laughs> so the next one is from Monia Martins. Hi, I'm Monia Martins from University of Aveiro, Professor John Continuum Group. I don't have a microphone. Thank you for the presentation, very nice talk. My question is, if the excipient is not a polymer, let's say it's a turpent, then the TG line has a different me meaning and we will have an excipient solubility curve. Do you, did you do some stability test or prediction in this kind of systems? We did. Uh, this is what um, people, let's say, know, know as a normal, um, eutectic system. So that means you have not only the solubility line of the API in, in the excipient, but from the other side you have a melting point of this excipient somewhere on the axis, and then you have also uh, a solubility line of the, a of the excipient in the API, so to say. Uh, this is true. Uh, we have a paper out on um, the, the pharmacists call this self-emulsifying systems, uh, to us uh, there's nothing else than an, a eutectic system. So what, what, they con what they observed is that if they have a solid API and a solid excipient and they mix them together in a certain ratio, then at a given temperature they might end up with a liquid. I mean, this is very clear to us that this happens in eutectic systems. Um, and this is also, of course, found in pharmaceutical systems. They call this self emulsified systems. And we have also applied normal thermodynamics to this, and this worked quite nicely. So, again, this is nothing special. This is only to, to uh, let's say, to realize uh, that what is measured and investigated and given a different name is, in fact, something we already know from thermodynamics. So, this this works very fine and we have also uh, investigated formulations where the excipient is not a polybear but a glyceride. Uh, and glycerides also have melting points in normal temperature uh, ranges and this is also the case that they had two solubility lines there. So uh, this works as, uh, this is nothing, again, this works by applying, uh, we are happy that it works by applying normal thermodynamics and it's also, these systems can be covered very nicely. Thank you. We have another question from our YouTube viewers, Emmanuel Crespo. Have you considered to introduce an hydrotope into the system and check if the model is able to predict the change in the IP, IP, IPI solubility line and there is an increase in the stability region? Uh, I did not understand the very first sentence. So introduce what? Um, introduce the hydrotrope into the system and check if the model is able to predict the change in the API solubility line. Is this about, I, I still don't get it. Is, that, is it about hydrates? Uh, we have to <laughs> wait to get yeah, to. I, I'm not sure what, what, what really the question is about. Okay. 
Um, so we're gonna ask yeah. another one if I, and wait if the person. Yeah, it would be nice to, 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 to more explain what is really meant. At the moment, I, I don't get it. Uh, we have another question from mm -hmm. Gabriel Silva. First, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I would like to make two questions, if I am able. My question is, if there are works regarding lipid-based formulations. A second question is regarding drug delivery systems with lipid-based formulations, because there is a problem of pH shifts during the digestion, with which provokes precipitation of the drug. Have, it, have they studied this problem yet? Um, yes, this is true. As, as, I, as I said, for, uh, we, we also have works on, on dissolution and also for our solubility uh, works. Uh, a lot of the APIs hugely have a, have a solubility that really remarkably depends on pH. Uh, and then, of course, then you have to, to account for that. Uh, and this is what we do. So this is this is um, what we usually do is we try to get the solubility for the um, neutral species, and then we account for the dissociation equilibrium at different pH. So there is let's say normal so-called henderson hasselbalch uh, equation that is more or less a mass balance, uh, which accounts for the dissociation of the of the molecules, uh, and this is quite easy and uh, if you combine this dissociation equilibrium of the API, this uh, the solubility uh, calculation for the neutral molecule, you can very nicely uh, get the solubility as function of pH. So this works very nicely. The only thing you need to know is the pKa value, which is the equilibrium constant of the dissociation equilibrium. But this is what the pharmacist have to provide for getting their uh, API approved. So this is always available. Uh, and we have used this very often and this works very nicely. And this is totally true that this is very important because in the uh, stomach, uh, the, a the pH can be as small as one. So in the stomach, uh, in a fasted state, uh, the pH is between one and two. And in the intestine, it's between five and eight. Also, depending on whether you have eaten something, yes or no. Uh, so that is, is, is indeed for, this, um, for the dissolution in the body, uh, the pH dependence is very important. And so we have accounted for, for that also. And, but this works comparatively easy. So this, this works, this, we could say this is solved. So I'm going to go back to the question, the other question. Uh, Emmanuel said, uh, I'm going to read it and then read the explanation. Okay. Uh, have you considered to introduce the anhydrotrope? And he said, um, some compound like glycoether that can increase the solubility of hydro hydrophobic compounds in that water uh, into the systems and check if the model is able to predict the change in the API solubility line and there is an increase in the stability region. So, so what, we, what we did is uh, we investigated, for example, the solubility, as I said, in water, uh, but not just in water, but in water plus, plus additives, because this is very, very important for the dissolution of the API in the body. And there you have a lot of excipients. So the body is not just water. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of salts in, in there. It's not actually in glycol, hopefully, in there, but different compounds uh, uh, and excipients. Uh, and of course, we investigated the influence of those excipients on the solubility of the excipients uh, in water. And also, this is uh, doable by, again, of course, you need then the um, water parameters also for these components. Uh, but once you have them, uh, you, you can model it. So there's not a general, uh, let's say, it's not a general problem. So this can be done for the components on systems. We have done it so far. It, I, I would say in general, it, it, it works. Sometimes we need uh, temperature dependent KIJs, but uh, you, it's, I mean, it, of course it depends on a, com on a particular system, but so far we have, we have found ways to model this.
Thank you. Um, I'm going to perform the last question, <laughs> okay? Because uh, it's from Marcelo Geddes. Did you bef perform the NIF crystallization modeling for prediction from water absorption experiments? If so, what, what approach was used to describe it? I actually don't know if it's NIF or NIF. Yeah, NIF, this is Nifidipine. This is, what, this is probably the substance I had here. This is this one. Uh, yeah, uh, we did. We did water absorption, uh, both water absorption measurements. Actually, this is this is the result of a water absorption measurement so you see here. This is, this is a Nifidipine system. Uh, so what you what you see is that this is this is the water absorption of the amorphous uh, nifedipine, and this is the water absorption of the equilibrium crystallized nifedipine. Uh, sorry, this is not the nifedipine. This is nifedipine in a polymer, of course. But what we also do is we do uh, also the, the same thing. So you could you could do uh, this apparatus. This can be uh, go back one. So this this of course can be. This can be a formulation, but of course, we can do the same experiment with just the pure API. It can be crystalline or amorphous API. Um, so this is uh, experimentally, this is not a difference. I mean, this is a balance and the balance just weighing the sample, whatever it is. Uh, and so we have, an, I'm not sure for nifedipine, but we do this for uh, several APIs. We do have uh, those absorption uh, measurements uh, and this is for example what we also use to uh, get the binary parameters of the system API water so as I said we have we need this parameter binary parameter between API water we could determine this in fact from the other side of the phase diagram meaning dissolving the API in water but usually those solubilities are very, very low, and that's why very, very hard to measure. The sorption measurement is just the other side of the diagram. Here we have the solution of water in uh, the API, and this can be measured much more precisely because the balance here is measuring 0.1 milligram. And if you make the sample big enough, you can really measure very nicely measure the water uptake so this is uh, let's say a standard method we also use to determine the binary parameters between the api and water it's the sorption of water in the api the problem is if the api is crystallizing uh, what you have seen here then of course uh, we have not only the sorption but we have also the crystallization so in this diagram we would use a very point up point here hoping or let's say assuming that we do have at least here still the amorphous uh, API and we do not have to account for the uh, crystallization. But water absorption in uh, pure APIs, we do measure it and we also use this for the modeling and even for fitting our parameters, the binary ones. So our time is almost over. I want to thank everyone for this discussion. Between here and on our YouTube channel, we've got almost 100 simultaneous viewers. So thank everyone. And once again, thank you, Professor Sadowski, for the presentation. Thank, thank you very much for making this possible. I mean, this is a very, this is, for, but this is one of the good things of Corona, <laughs> that we have things like this. And it's, of course, much easier to give this talk from home than to travel all the way along to, to Rio and back. Although, of course, Rio is much nicer than Dortmund, I have to admit. I don't know. <laughs> right is. now, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if, if now I'm it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, our seminars are being recorded and posted on YouTube, of course, after the invited lecturers agreement. Thank you. To every of you to listen it was very it was very fun <laughs> very nice experience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>